Freud is the one who talked about the four core fears. And I think we don't give him enough credit as somebody who really understood development. He talked about the core anxieties in a way that illuminated the path towards increasing understanding of anxiety. It makes me very sad to see child and adolescent psychiatry become more and more biological in the frame that is given to the sources of anxiety. And I think that is one of the reasons that our sandwich starts with developmental trajectory, which includes individual differences in developmental trajectories because definitely different children are more sensitive to sources of risk, are more fearful, others are bolder, more uh, daring in the way that they explore and others are much more easily intimidated by intense um, Stephen life, for example. So there really, I think we have to acknowledge that there is a biological root to individual differences in predisposition to anxiety. But then the extent to which the environment can either exacerbate those individual propensities or contain them and modulate them so that predisposition, biological predisposition, does not mean that the outcome is predetermined. And here, I think, is where the understanding of how wise babies are in understanding sources of risk and having the first fear, the first anxiety, be anxiety about being left about not having a caregiver that is responsive within a reasonable period of time to experiences of distress. It's very interesting going back and forth between the Freudian perception and the attachment theory perception, which puts the fear of being left, the fear of loss, the fear of separation, which becomes quite intense at around eight to 10 months and continues in the first 18 months, two years of life, to put it in the context of how adaptive it is. Bowlby talked about how where Freud went wrong was in thinking that the fear of loss the fear of frightening stimuli is a neurotic fear that has no basis in reality. And Bowlby said, when you think about it, it is very functional from the perspective of survival that a child will be afraid of being alone, will be afraid of the dark, will be afraid of intense uh, noises, will be afraid of looming objects, because all of these stimuli are associated with greater environmental danger in the uh, context of evolution. Predators, helplessness, much more likely then that we will fall prey to, 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 to these dangers. So it makes so much sense for a child to be afraid of being alone, even if that means that the mom went to the bathroom, which the child has no way, a baby has no way of knowing that she's just in the bathroom and she is, she's out of sight, out of mind. And when it goes on for a while, it becomes a source of uncertainty that can be quite overwhelming. When trauma comes in, 
then it becomes real. The mom doesn't come back or the dad doesn't come back. And then the existential question of what will happen to me without the person that I turn to for protection and caregiving becomes overwhelming and creates helplessness and terror. So that's the first fear, I think, that we experience. And as the child starts creating a theory of mind where he or she understands how people relate to each other and starts reading the facial cues of approval and disapproval, then the fear of not being approved of, which becomes, does that mean that you don't love me? And if you don't love me, will you leave me? So the the context between the different fears, the, the way that they come together with catastrophic potential consequences is what the child is, is coping with. Um, Jerome Kagan, who was certainly no admirer of psychoanalytic theory or of attachment theory, but who gave us an enormous contribution through his understanding of the inhibited temperament and the shy uh, trait of moving away from novelty um, because of fear of danger, the danger of novelty. He talked about the fact that 18-month-olds anticipate disapproval, even in the absence of active disapproval. And he has um, a book, I think it's called The Second Year of Life, where he gives an ex- an, uh, the results of an experiment where the child and the experimenter are together solving a puzzle. And the experimenter solves the puzzle herself, and the child watches. And then the experimenter says, now you solve the puzzle. But it's a puzzle that is too hard for the child, so there's no way that the child would be able to fix it. And the child tries and tries and tries, and then gets so upset about not being able to do it and looks at the experimenter with beseeching and worried eyes. And Jerome Kagan interprets this behavior as meaning, does that mean that I don't live up to your expectations? Here you were asking me to do it, and I could not do it. What does it mean in terms of approval? So I I was very touched when I read that example, because it made me understand how across different theoretical preferences we can converge on an understanding of how children long for the approval of adults and how badly they feel when they don't have it. The third fear which co-occurs with the fear of losing love is the fear of body damage. Of course, Freud was mesmerized by the idea of castration anxiety. And as feminism became social movement, etc., there was contempt about this idea of castration anxiety. And one of the constructive aspects of that need to dismiss the idea of castration anxiety was its ex- expansion into an understanding that young children, toddlers, are afraid of losing parts of their body. They don't like to have their hair cut, many of them. They don't like to have their nails cut. They don't. They have difficulty perhaps being toilet trained because they think that their poops are part of their body and that it gets flushed <laughs> all the time. Different children have different vulnerabilities to this. Some children don't worry about those things. Other children are overwhelmed by it. Um, What's interesting to me is that 
many little girls are very worried about the fact that they don't have penises. And many little boys are afraid of losing their penises. And I think it is part and parcel of the child's effort to make sense of what is the body about. Robbie Harris, uh, who is a marvelous uh, book author, wrote a book that is priceless about who has what, that guides children about how what they have is just right. And Mr. Rogers had a song, right? Boys are fancy on the outside and girls are fancy on the inside. <laughs> so this is a very uh, legitimate fear of children that I think we need to take seriously. And different cultures have ways of saying uh, sana sana, kissing the booby, the boob, uh, etc., of reassuring children that this, this is not uh, destroying the body, that this, is, this will heal. The final fear is the fear of what Freud called superego condemnation. The idea that one, at three to five years of age, one has internalized social expectations about what it takes to be loved, what it takes to be accepted, what it takes to be protected. And there is great fear of not living up to the expectations of society because, of course, none of us lives up 100% of the time to the expectations of society. And the fear of ostracism, the fear of being excluded, goes back to the question of being left. What will happen to me? People died if they were not in the context of their society, right? And so, the, But at the same time, the adaptive component is that this is a moral conscience. This is why I need to choose good rather than choose bad. And then what happens to me when I worry that I chose badly? And that is where parents can be so confirming of the fear when they say, you are bad, I don't want you, etc. It confirms for the child this feeling of, I cannot be loved. And all of these fears then move in the context of trauma from being internal fears that can be assuaged through protective and loving caregiving to real life confirmations of that inner experience. And then we have a much harder time in therapy, right? Explaining that it is not the child's fault. It is what happened to the child, what the parent went through. 